Hi everyone, for those joining, my name is Maria Perotti and I am the media manager for the Migrant Rights Coalition, including international unions and human rights organizations like Fair Square. Thank you so much for making the time and space to attend Fair Square's news conference today on the case of World Cup whistleblower Abdullah Pais. Fair Square, which has been working on this case before it went public last year, will be describing recent developments including a complaint to the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. They will read out a family statement, which will be shared with you via email shortly, and they will answer your questions. Um, a quick note, um, due to a registration issue today that you will see a few Maria Parodis on this call, um, I ask all the other Marias to please uh, mute themselves and take themselves off camera. And when you are ready to ask your question at the end of this panel, just make sure to write your name and the organization that you are representing in the chat so we can identify who you are. Um, speaking today will be Fair Square's founding co-directors, Nicholas McGeehan and James Lynch. Nick? Hey, thanks, Maria. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Let me just share my screen here. Uh, OK. Um, yeah, now, um, today's press conference, we will go through the details of the case, but um, first of all, let's um, let's go back to um, the new development, though there are a couple of new developments. Um, the first was that on the 7th of November, Qatar's final court, the Court of Cassation, upheld Abdullah's conviction, um, and so he will remain in, in jail um, for three years, um, unless he's given some sort of pardon. So the legal channels for him to be freed are now closed, unfortunately. Um, the, the big bigger development, arguably, is that today his family submitted a complaint and an urgent appeal, in fact, uh, to the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. Uh, the UN Working Group is a human rights expert uh, committee um, sitting in the United Nations, all independent human rights experts, whose job it is to look at the legality of detentions. Um, they can request information from states involved, a power that NGOs generally don't have. Not all states will respond to that. Um, but if they don't, the working group can issue an opinion, essentially saying that they, in their view, the, the detention is um, is arbitrary, is illegal, essentially. Um, I would say that um, the important thing to remember about this case is that it directly implicates both FIFA's World Cup organisers, the Supreme Committee, and FIFA, um, which is why that we're so pleased to be, well, pleased is not the right word, but announcing this in, in, in the middle of Qatar's World Cup. Um, Abdullah's family can't be on this call. Um, neither his wife nor his brothers. Um, now that, that says something in itself. So we're going to have James Lynch, my co-director, read out a, a statement from the family first. Um, James? Hi, thank you, Nick. <clears throat> yep, so I'm going to read the statement now. And the title of the statement is a family man and a father of two young kids assaulted, put into solitary and tortured with cold temperature to silence his voice during the World Cup. A public statement from the family of Abdullah Ibhais, the prisoner of Qatar FIFA World Cup 2002. Abdullah Ibhais has exhausted all legal channels as Doha has failed him. Denied the chance of fair trial from the very beginning, he was interrogated without a lawyer by state security police in a case which they admitted does not pertain to state security. Abdullah was denied access to any information about his case for one whole year while awaiting the court. Abdullah was allowed to present oral defence in just one single instance in the three levels of court he stood before. His lawyer was allowed to speak for just five minutes. Abdullah is a father of two children, four and six years old, who keep asking their mother every day, why has dad stopped loving us? Abdullah himself lost his father at the age of two without the opportunity to really know him. He had only shadows of memories of him. His biggest concern was to protect his children from that painful experience, but someone in Qatar has decided otherwise. Our beloved Abdullah has stood up bravely for his conscience, for his family, for his children, and for a country he thought he was, set, he was helping to set an example in organizing the first World Cup in an Arab state. He was unafraid to challenge his superiors. Abdullah was trying to showcase Qatar in its best light, to own up to its mistakes and to do right by them and all the migrant workers who have suffered as a result. We never thought he would become a political prisoner. 
Abdullah used FIFA's own systems to speak up. Instead, he's been punished. We, the family of Abdullah Ibhais, are calling out FIFA and its president, Gianni Infantino, who once said, the World Cup is the voice of the marginalized. Your deeds haven't lived up to your words. FIFA is complicit in Abdullah's imprisonment and FIFA's silence is tearing apart our family. We refuse FIFA's callous indifference. We refuse to back down. We're calling today on FIFA to take responsibility and finally own up to this human rights travesty. We call upon the Qatari authorities for Abdullah's immediate release and ask all human rights organizations, journalists, activists, players, and the audience of the World Cup to raise their voices and call for freedom for Abdullah. The stark difference between the two scenes at the time of the World Cup opening will always haunt us as his family. On one hand, football fans around the world celebrated the start of the long-awaited event with all the joy, the talent, the surprises and the amusement that the World Cup carries whenever it occurs. At the same time, however, Abdullah spent four of those days between 2nd and 6th of November in complete darkness in solitary confinement after being physically assaulted by the prison guards. He was in a cell of two by one meters with a hole in the ground as a bathroom and with temperatures near freezing as the prison's central air conditioning was used as a torture device. The paradox of these two scenes happening a few kilometers apart will forever torture us. I think the temperature reached four Celsius at some points. I was already suffering from several bruises after the prison guards assault and I was shivering all the time as the cold air directed to me never stopped. I hardly slept during those four days, he told us. The prisoners, prison's administration's pretext for this torture is that he was trying to smuggle a letter to his wife. The real cause, however, is the broadcast of the documentary, Kata, A State of Fear, on ITV1 in the UK, where Abdullah's case was one of the main cases presented. The Qatari embassy in London sent its response to ITV1's request for comment on the 30th of October. Abdullah was in solitary confinement two days later, one day ahead of the broadcast. When Abdullah was out of solitary, his wife was allowed to visit him for a few minutes. She was told all visits to Abdullah would be monitored and recorded, and for two weeks he was not allowed any visits. While he was under this total ban of communication, the Court of Cassation chose to pick his case up after a nine month freeze. When the surprise hearing was held, Abdullah was not in court, and neither was his lawyer. The verdict was to reject the appeal in a judgment that forms a disgrace to legal reasoning. The court held to the coerced confession. It admitted that it was taken in the absence of his lawyer, but blamed Abdullah for not having a lawyer while in custody. The court admitted that the confession is not supported by any physical evidence, but said it had the full authority to decide if a retracted confession should be taken into consideration. Crucially, the court admitted that the alleged crime did not take place, but said that the intention to commit it is punishable by law. If that is not a show trial, nothing is. 7th of December, 2022. That's the end of the statement. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, it's quite hard to, to hear that. I, I, I spent a lot of time talking to Abdullah before he was um, before he was taken into custody eventually in November last year. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to quickly run through the details of the case for people who aren't necessarily familiar with them. Um, on the front of this slideshow here is is a is a copy from the or a screenshot of a WhatsApp conversation between Hassan Al Thawadi in white and Abdullah uh, in green. Um, and, and and I guess a lot of this case goes back to to this this discussion. Um, and what was remarkable about the case, I think, was the information that that Abdullah provided us with about this World Cup. Um, um, which says a lot about how it's been run and why it's been run. Um, so just going through the, the timeline. Um, on the 4th of August 2019, there was a worker strike outside um, Doha in the Al-Shahania labour camp. Um, there was a concern among the Supreme Committee that it involved workers building stadiums. Um, Abdullah went out to the strike, realised that it was. It did involve workers building stadiums uh, and therefore advised the Supreme Committee um, to say so, to acknowledge their role in it and to fix the problem. The Supreme Committee ignored his advice um, and they essentially denied that the strike had anything to do with them. Um, a couple of months later, on the 9th of November, the Supreme Committee 
the World Cup organizers submitted a file containing very serious allegations about Abdullah to the Qatari authorities. Um, they suggested that he had been um, consorting uh, with figures from the Saudi media um, and that he was out to damage the state, as they said it. Uh, excuse me, my doorbell's ringing in the, in the background. Um, three days after that, three days after the World Cup organizers submitted this complaint, um, Abdullah was detained uh, by Qatari state security. He was taken from the offices of the Qatar Supreme Committee and into custody. In custody, he was threatened uh, with uh, state security detention, which would have meant six months without a lawyer. Um, he was told that if he asked for a lawyer, they would break his legs. And he ultimately, he signed a confession under duress. It took a very long time for this case to reach trial, uh, but eventually it did. Now, what was interesting about it was he did not sign a confession on the charge of a state security violation. He signed a confession for a lesser charge of bribery. Uh, with a lesser um, sentence attached to it. Um, as I said, it took a long time for the case to reach trial. Um, ultimately, he was convicted of bribery, violation of the integrity of tenders, and damage to public intentional damage to public funds. Now, crucially, this was based entirely on his confession. There was no other evidence provided. Uh, analysis of the court judgments uh, revealed that the, the, the judge relied squarely on this. In fact, um, testimony from witnesses tended actually to suggest that Abdullah was innocent of the crime. Um, a police officer who was interrogated about um, the case said that he hadn't analysed evidence that was supposedly provided by the Supreme Committee to the police authorities. Um, it was in September 2021 where Abdullah finally contacted rights groups about his case. Um, again, what was remarkable about him and his case was how much information he supplied us with. You often get contacted by people who say they have been unfairly detained and who make wild allegations about the reasons for that. Um, Abdullah provided us with a lot of evidence to support his claims. On the 5th of October, um, we decided uh, Human Rights Watch and Fair Square to publish some details of the case. We focused squarely on the fair square on, on the fair trial violations. We did not go into the other allegations um, that Abdullah had made. Uh, it is fair to say uh, that he had some incendiary allegations about the Supreme Committee and their conduct. Um, we decided that it would make more sense just to focus on the fair trial issues uh, and left it to Abdullah to decide whether or not he wanted to, um, to, to take a more robust approach with this case. Um, but on the 25th of October, um, he decided that he wanted to go public. Um, FIFA had not responded uh, particularly encouragingly or favourably to his outreach to them. Uh, the Qatari authorities had not indicated that they had any intention to, um, or the Qatari Supreme Committee did not indicate any intention to call for his fair trial. And so on the 25th of October, um, he went pu public with his full allegations in a, an article published by the Norwegian football magazine, Yosimar. Uh, he remained out um, and free and with his family uh, until the 15th of November. Um, but in the early hours of the 15th of November, um, he called the German journalist Benjamin Best to say he was being taken into custody, that Qatari authorities had arrived and were executing the sentence that was handed down to him in, in April. Um, since then, uh, there have been, uh, and there was an appeal court judgment in December and then the November. Uh, court of Cassation judgment, um, which the family did not find out about uh, until several weeks later. That that sentence was was executed on the 7th of November um, and Abdullah's brothers and his wife did not find out about it until the end of the month. Um, that's a picture of Abdullah there. Um, we're very hopeful that the, the working group will find um, that this is an arbitrary detention. Um, to us, to Human Rights Watch, it looks like an open and closed case. Three separate courts have relied on a confession. No other evidence has been provided. The Supreme Committee has talked a lot about supposed recordings, about other evidence it has in its possession. The court has never seen that. The court has not considered that. And the Supreme Committee has never provided it to anybody, although it talks to about this evidence to every journalist that it briefs privately about this case. And it does that a lot. Um, in conclusion, I guess, um, there's a lot about this case that we're not going to know, um, and I don't think we'll ever know. 
I don't think we'll ever know precisely who stitched Abdullah up and why they did that. Um, various people have different theories on that. Um, my own theory um, is that intense paranoia around Saudi and Emirati efforts to strip Qatar of the World Cup, um, which were at their height round about the time of his imprisonment, is probably in some way related to this. Um, but there are other, th other theories. Um, I know that um, James Corbett, um, a journalist, has done a lot of work on this issue. Um, and his own view, having spoken to people very close to the Supreme Committee, that it was the fact that Abdullah had turned down uh, a bid uh, for work from a member of the Al Thani family, that meant that he was um, he was going to have to be in the firing line for something, and this was the way that this was done. Um, again, I'm not sure whether um, you know. I don't think we'll ever know the answer to that. Um, what we do know, and what we have a mountain of evidence to demonstrate, is that there was a clearly unfair trial. Um, that uh, evidence that he. Um, retracted in court in the form of his, his confession was never was never uh, investigated um, and there's no physical evidence uh, to support any of the claims against them. Um, so as I said we're very hopeful that the, the working group will find positively um, in the case and that that will put further pressure on Qatar and crucially on, on FIFA. Um, this is one of many human rights issues that will not go away um, when the spotlight goes from the football. Um, and we hope that um, this will be part of the, will be a successful campaign to free him and get him back to his wife um, and to his two young boys, one of whom is, is pictured there. Um, so I think I'll stop there um, and open it for, for questions. I'm not sure if it's possible to ask questions in the chat box um, or if people are able to, to ask questions by, um, um, can, can speak to ask questions, but, um, that's the conclusion of the, the introductory part of this. Okay, question. Uh, and just a uh, reminder for those asking questions to please um, write your name and um, which media affiliate you are with. Thank you so, again. So, so the question has been the complaint we filed to the UN panel at this point. Can you share the text of it? Um, it has been filed. Uh, the family um, have filed it with the working group. Um, in terms of the text, um, uh, I'm not sure if we can share it. I, I, I don't necessarily see a problem with that, although I don't think it would be particularly interesting to, to journalists. It's a, it's a detailed pro forma questionnaire that um, families um, or, or those affected have to fill in, um, and the family has done that. Um, the, the critical part of it is, is the place where we make the fair trial um, argument, and that argument is really straightforward. Um, Abdullah was interrogated without a lawyer. Um, he signed a confession under duress. Um, now, people can make those allegations all the time, but if someone makes an allegation like that in court, it's the duty of the court to investigate that and to establish whether or not um, the confession was given freely and fairly. And if it wasn't, they have to provide other evidence to support the charges. Three separate courts haven't done that. We have the full text um, of those judgments sitting there. Um, and in that sense, I think um, the working group should, in my view, uh, and hopefully in the view of um, and view of Human Rights Watch as well, should be able to um, conclude fairly easily um, that this is an arbitrary detention um, because of the, the demonstrable unfairness of the trial. Um, so we'd be happy to outline the, the legal arguments that have been used, but I would also direct you to three separate press statements from Human Rights Watch and Fair Square, um, which, we can, um, which we can share after this, which, which I think demonstrate this is really an open and shut case of unfair trial. And Nick, we also have a question from Inside the Games. Uh, what contact is there with Abdullah at the moment, if any? Um, so his, um, his family have sporadic contact with him. Um, uh, there have been various times where visits have been uh, denied to them, um, as you heard in the family statement. Um, the mistreatment that he, he he alleges he was subjected to was from an attempt to, to sneak a, a letter um, to the family 
Um, so uh, communication is, is uh, as I say, it's sporadic. It's not as regular as they would like. Um, and um, it is very difficult to get to get reliable information um, consistently from Abdullah, although obviously, as you heard, um, he is able to, to get information out from time to time. We also received a question from the Independent. When we take this to FIFA, we'll get the briefing we got before, which now increasingly aligns with Qatar. What would you say is best to question to put them to kind of pierce their denial and to demonstrate their culpability? Why, why won't they specifically call for a fair trial in this case? Why can't they do that? This, this case was instigated by their partners. The Supreme Committee put Abdullah in harm's way when they handed that file of unsubstantiated, unprovoked, unproven allegations and unevidenced allegations. They put him in harm's way. FIFA don't have to say anything about what they think about the merits of this case, but it is absolutely incumbent upon them to specifically demand that this man get a fair trial. Um, and why have they not done that? All they have done to date is say uh, that every person deserves a fair trial. That's a meaningless statement, <laughs> utterly meaningless statement that gets their Qatari partners completely off the hook. If FIFA demands a fair trial for this, then we can start to really put questions on the Qatari authorities. But for so long as FIFA does not do that, um, then, um, then they, are, you know, they are implicated in this denial of justice, and very heavily so, I think. Thanks, Nick. Uh, we have a question from the D Danish Broadcasting Corporation. The Working Group on Arbitrary Detention has no enforcement power of its own. What effect do you hope this step will have? Well, there's a couple of things that are interesting. First of all, they, they write to the state. Um, the state doesn't have an obligation to respond, um, but the state is given the opportunity to respond to the allegations. I.e., if the state finds uh, that the allegations that are being made are unfair, if there's evidence missing, if we've got something wrong, the state has every opportunity to say this to the working group, and the working group might not then find that the detention is arbitrary. So the state cannot hide behind any claims that they weren't consulted. They're given the full option to do that, which means that when the findings come out, they have particular weight, not just because of who's involved, a group of independent United Nations human rights experts, but because of the consultation of the state. I think what's interesting about this is if we have a finding of arbitrary detention in a case that involves FIFA, right, or embroils FIFA, let's say, um, then that case is not going to go away. Um, and we'll continue talking about that case until Abdullah's out. Um, and I think it would also put the pressure on the next World Cup hosts, for example, the United States. Do they really want to have this millstone around their neck as they prepare to host this next tournament? You would hope not. So it could be a, it's a potentially significant um, finding um, if, if, the arbitrary, if the group uh, finds in the affirmative. And we have a follow-up question from Inside the Games. If the UN group does accept your assessment, what happens then? Um, again, we would want to prejudge their assessment. Um, um, Human Rights Watch and Fair Square, we, we, we have characterized it as an unfair trial. The family has submitted the complaint, um, you know, asking them to, to give their assessment of it and why they think it's an unfair trial. Just sorry. That's a, that's, a, that's a sort of technicality. Um, what, what will happen then? Um, it, it will increase the pressure. Um, you know, we cannot um, force the Qataris to, to, to let this man out. Um, but FIFA uh, can exert significant influence on this. FIFA's sponsors can exert significant influence on this. And they have been asked to do so. And I've said nothing publicly about this case, um, which I think is a, uh, is, a, is a failing on their part. Um, so we would hope that this would just add to the pressure, I think. And a related question from the BBC. Um, when would you hear from the working group? What's the timeline like? Um, and what do you want to hear from them? Um, and we have a separate question from them that we can um, address. Sure. So it's been it's submitted as an urgent appeal uh, and as a complaint. 
Um, urgent appeal means that the, the working group can contact the state directly because they are concerned about the well-being um, of Abdullah. Um, given recent developments, the family felt that that was appropriate to submit it as an urgent appeal. In relation to the complaint, the state has 60 days, I believe, um, to re respond, um, but it can take several months, depending on the caseload of the working group, um, to arrive at, at a conclusion as to whether or not the detention is arbitrary. Um, um, we're not experts on, on the, the, the process of this, but that's my understanding of it. So we could be waiting several months before we actually hear from the working group um, in terms of the decision. And the other question from the BBC is regarding the timeline of the family statement that James read aloud. The time that is described when he was in solitary confinement in that very, very cold environment. Um, they're wondering if it's on the same day as the opening ceremony. I would have to check with the family. Um, and one thing to say is, I think we can make the family statement available to, to anyone who would like it. We can circulate it to press list, I believe, Maria, right? Yes, and folks here should have received that in their email right now. Um, right. So if you did not receive that, let us know. And um, a reminder, um, you can ask your questions in the Q&A box and um, just feel free to um, share your name as there are a few other Marias. Uh, we have a question now from um, regarding Abdullah's mental physical health um, at this stage, whether we have any information on this. Um, when I first spoke to him, it was obvious that this was having a heavy burden on him. He was... Um, um, you know, mentally, he, he was very open about the, the toll it had taken on him. He was on um, he was on medication to address it. Um, I believe in, 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 in detention, he has had um, swings in terms of his mental state. Um, you might recall that um, after he was taken into detention, he went on hunger strike immediately. Um, that lasted for an extremely uh, risky amount of time. Um, before he finally um, came off that hunger strike. Um, the information we've had, as I said, has been sporadic um, and patchy coming from the family. Uh, we've never spoken to him directly. Um, I believe he was said to be extremely upset, as you, as you would understand he would be, when he heard about the Court of Cassation judgment, which closes off the legal avenues for his release. Um, but yeah, certainly from, from what I know about the case and from my experience of talking to both him before his detention and his brother since his detention, um, he, he, yeah, he, he's in a he's in a difficult place mentally, uh, frequently, um, uh, during his detention. Although he appears to have periods where uh, he is more optimistic about his case. We've also received a question from the Guardian. Um, regarding a statement from FIFA, FIFA in November 2021 that they would be following the case closely. Um, they're asking if you know what contact, if any, um, FIFA has had with either Abdullah or the Supreme Committee regarding the case since then. Yeah, so and we can provide details of this. Um, Abdullah submitted a complaint via FIFA's whistleblowing platform very quickly um, after he contacted us in, in so September 2021, or October 2021. Um, and initially there was some contact back and forth. In fact, he was messaging directly members of um, FIFA's sort of um, human rights team. Um, at some point, however, they just disappeared. Um, they essentially ghosted them, for want of a better word, um, and he had no further communication from them after that. Um, and as as I just said, you know, the 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 organisation then refused to call for his his release. Um, so there was initial com uh, initial communication. I can share that with you. Um, you know, screenshots of the of the WhatsApps. 
um, from his side anyway, um, revealing his his obvious dismay at the fact that he felt that FIFA had abandoned his case. How did FIFA and the Supreme Committee communicate on the case? I would say the way that they, I don't know for sure, but the way they communicate on every case, which is they are uh, lockstep uh, in their communications on everything. I find it very hard to distinguish a Supreme Committee statement these days from a from a FIFA statement. Um, they they are certainly in the context of this this World Cup. They seem to be pretty much the same organisation. I just saw John, um, the AP um, question about the physical abuse. Uh, when was he beaten and how badly? We, we'll share the um, we'll share the family statement. Um, that was information that was relayed directly to the family, um, and the family have then put that down in writing, um, and it was read out at the start. But we can share that with you. Um, we only got um, we only got note of it um, uh, yesterday, um, so I'm not exactly sure of the precise details. Although Abdullah believes it was related to to this ITV um, this ITV show, um, which featured his brother and his case in some detail. And a related question from the BBC as to um, whether we know when the last time he had spoken to his family was, um, and how recent was that contact? I'm, I'm I'm not sure to be honest, but we can um, we can get that information to you. Um, as I said, we'd 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 wanted the family to be on this and um, to give their perspective, but um, due to the uh, I guess fear of reprisals, um, they felt that the safest thing to do. Um, was for them not to appear, um, but they are available to speak um, uh, to anyone who wants to talk to them directly, um, the brothers, that is. And a note on that, please um, do write us a note if you would like to be connected, and we'll make sure to follow up on that. Um, we also have a, a question from La Mina, La Mida Inglesa from Spain. Um, do you expect that Abdullah's situation could change in any positive way when the World Cup is over? And if all the media attention around the country has reduced? I, I, yeah, I think it's possible. Um, I think I think it is possible that the the Qataris will reach an assessment that his continued imprisonment serves little purpose for them. And he has said everything he has to say. Um, the pressure on them is off. Um, um, and keeping him in prison will, will simply um, keep the spotlight on them that they don't need. Um, but again, we don't know how, how personal this case is. Um, we don't precisely know the, the motivations for, for putting him in jail. Um, so that, that assessment might might be missing some vital context that we don't know about. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I just did a message from Abdullah's, um, Abdullah's family. They say the last time he contacted the family was on the 5th of December. Um, they said that he was in solitary confinement from the 2nd to the 6th of November. Um, so it was before the World Cup opening, which was on the on the 20th of November. Um, and he was barred from all contact from his family between the 14th and the 20th of November. Um, that's the information that I've just had from, um, from Abdullah's family regarding confinement and the World Cup opening. We've received a question from The Telegraph. Infantino failed to do a press conference today, instead releasing a pre-recorded video. How would you describe his conduct in recent weeks? Would you urge the Olympic movement to reflect a potential bid for the games from Qatar in 2030? Infantino's conduct. Yeah, it, it, it leaves you stretching for adjectives to appropriately reflect um, just how badly this man is, is misgoverning the game. Um, he appears to be entirely deluded as to as to his status um, and unwilling to exert any sort of positive influence on the game 
or to take FIFA in any direction, any positive direction at all. I do think I do think we need to have a conversation after this World Cup about the governance of the game uh, and about the ability and the capacity of FIFA as an organisation to continue to do that. And Abdullah's case is just one example of this. Um, but Infantino's conduct in the last few months has been shameful. Um, he's been uh, he's been a disgrace to FIFA. Um, and he, uh, he, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, and what, sorry, what was the second question, Maria, there? The uh, about question? the bid, a potential bid in 2030. Should it be rejected? Um, um, well, um, let's put that in the context of a, of a compensation uh, claim that is currently ongoing. FIFA and the Qataris have been asked to compensate migrant workers who lost either their lives or their livelihoods or their wages in, 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 in the construction of this World Cup. They have absolutely refused to do that. I think any category bid for any sporting event whatsoever should be rejected out of hand uh, until they start negotiations on that call um, and begin to make, um, make uh, provide remedy for the people who have um, who've suffered in the construction of this. And a reminder, you can drop the question into the chat or into the Q&A. Um, we have a question from the BBC, whether we can share the details that um, Nick shared earlier from his family. We'll be sure to yeah. um, drop that in the chat and email that out as well. Right, I can do that, I think. I think I can do that now. Um, um, as we wait for folks to type their questions, um, Nick, is there anything else that you would like to share, share with us on this? Um, Nothing that, nothing that springs to mind. Um, I mean, the questions have, um, have covered a lot of the bases. Um, we'd be happy to share all the information people are asking for, which will add hopefully color and detail to some of this. Um, but um, there's nothing that immediately springs to mind. Seeing as we don't have further questions coming in. Um, thank you very much to everyone for your time during a very busy season for your attendance. Um, we're recording this, so we will check to see if we can share a recording of this um, news conference, and we'll be sure to um, send around any updates and any follow-ups. Feel free to let us know if you have further questions, if you would like clarity, and as we mentioned earlier, if you do um, want to be connected directly to the family. Um, let us know if you have any further questions and um, Nick, I'll let you get the last word of thanks in. Oh, uh, well, thanks to you. And, and thanks to everyone for, for showing up and showing interest in the case. I, I, I don't think it's, it's understandable why it hasn't got the attention that, that other issues have in this World Cup. I do think he deserves it. You know, so some people have said, you know, Abdullah wasn't a whistleblower. He didn't come forward until he was, he was in trouble, but he did come forward. He didn't need to go public with his case. He didn't need to tell us all these things about the Supreme Committee. He did us an enormous favour, in my view, about confirming some of the suspicions we had about how this has been conducted. Um, and I do think he deserves um he deserves attention and call him issues, call him inches, sorry. So so thank you for thanks for for coming to this. Um and thanks in advance for anything you write on it. Um, I'm sure the family will be hugely grateful. Um and we hope that that um we hope that it will help to hope to get him out and back to his kids. You know, he's got two young boys. Um and I yeah, when he when he spoke to me, the the thing that always made his voice quiver was the fear that he would be taken from them. You know, so it's a very personal story and a really sad story. Um, 
And yeah, I hope that your interest in it will, will resolve it or help resolve it. Thank you.